Welcome back to another video guys. Um, this is one um, one of the videos of the USME series. So this video, um, this series, I want to cater it more specifically for the medical students in Pakistan um, who are just starting off. Um, I, it's the video series I would have wanted to see in my third, fourth year of medical school. So this is for those. And today we have with us Muhammad Junaid Shah. He is from Shalamar Dental, uh, Dental College. Medical and Dental College. Medical and Dental College. college. Um, he, ma he's a, he matched into psych. I matched into internal medicine. He matched into psych. And I think psych in comparison is way more competitive. And I was like, there is no better person than Junaid to make a video regarding psych because you graduated in 2021 and from a relatively unknown medical school in Pakistan. Yeah. So to do that, I feel that's a massive achievement. Thank um, you. And okay, and I just want to add a little disclaimer. Um, in this video, Junaid is going to give you his opinion and advice, and I would probably be giving some advice as well. But please um, take your advice with a pinch of salt. We're no experts at this. Um, there are far more qualified people with loads of experience um, available on the internet and there are data statistical data and RMP data you can look it up on Google um, you know to fact check us so don't trust us blindly take our advice with a pinch of salt thank you so much Janet, for taking out your time and you know from your very busy schedule to <laughs> yeah <laughs> to, to, it is. To, yeah. It's busy yeah. for sure but yeah, yeah. Uh, no I'm glad to be here thank you so much for having me yeah and congrats on matching into site oh, thank you all right so uh, the first question um, your early life your journey so far, you can go back to like, if you remember things from your fetus, go ahead. <laughs> but like wherever, you can start off from wherever. What was your schooling like, um, you know, what, until this point? Yeah, the embryo life was certainly more relaxing than whatever it is now. But um, uh, so I'll, I'll start with a little bit of background regarding my family in general. Like, so basically, this is a classic case of somebody coming from a family of doctors. And a classic case, maybe in uh, basic terms of classic cases where you have somebody whose parents are doctors, whose siblings are doctors, and the per, you know, person we're talking about, and the pursuing medicine as well. That was basically my case, like, um, that was all I grew up with. My parents being doctors, my sisters being doctors. Um, I remember growing up, like, uh, even when I, I, as far back as elementary school and middle school, like, I would just come home to knowing that my mother, so my mother is an ob and my father is a general practitioner, so I would come home to usually, a, you know, some news about a case that she has to go on and she has to operate on. And my sister's talking about the new next anatomy test they had on that day. And, uh, you know, dad just, dad just being dad and taking care of everybody and their emotions. And I was like, okay, like this is what I grew up with. So, you know, when it came time to choose a major, like I didn't really choose much, I would say. Mm. You know, the, you could say the choice was basically made for me and I just decided to not, um, you know, not really embark on a different path, so to speak. Like uh, most people, when they match, not match. Like that's that's a word that's stuck on my tongue. Like when they go into medical school, like they're ecstatic, right? And yeah. I was happy. Yeah, I was happy. It wasn't the happiness that you could say it was like, oh my god, you're in medicine, congratulations. Yeah. It was like, oh wow, like you got medicine, congratulations. So it was kind of expected. Yeah, it was kind of expected. Like I, it, I didn't feel like it was something extraordinary because mm -hmm. it was just all around me, you know. So. Um, back then, like, uh, I don't know if you uh, know about this because I, I think you did OA levels, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you, what I, did you do? I did FS, FSC. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to go for the OA level route. Um, in hindsight, I would say I wanted to go for it. But at that particular moment, I was told, you know what? You're going to be in medicine. Like, this is what I was told. You're going to be in medicine. Like, no choice. Mm -hmm. You're going to be in medicine. So um, metric, FSC is a more smarter route. Like, I believe the equivalence that you get after you're done with your higher secondary education, mm -hmm. like, it's somewhat on the lower side if you're done with OA levels compared to if you attain a similar level of marks in FSC. I think this is more applicable in the Punjab side. The yeah, competition probably. is a lot more. I think in Sin, it doesn't really matter. Like, yes, maybe, maybe there's like a slight difference, but I don't think it matters that much in Sin. Okay. And yeah, so you did your FSC. I did my FSC and then I went to medical school. Um, and the rest Which of the medical year. school again exactly? Shalamar Medical at the college. That's I'll let a, you all fellow Shalamar is watching this if you are. So it's a private, relatively like if, like like if if you like if if you tell me what medical schools I know in Punjab, it's like mm -hmm. King Edward, Alama Iqbal, Fatima Jinnah. 
Yeah, there's something. Like that. <laughs> so yeah, I only know those um, CMH. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's Nost, I think. So I I know those. So Shalamar is Nost not on that is not on that yeah. list of medical schools I know. Yeah, yeah. Right. So what was like MCAT for you? Cause like um I just wanna like like it's so we get a lot of questions that oh I didn't get into King Ed we didn't get into King Ed yeah, right? yeah. we didn't get into the top medical school would we be able to do USME? Or, you know, we don't have an alumni network like Dow or King Edward. Does that make a difference? We get a lot of those questions. Sure, sure. So like, like Shalamar Medical School, like it's relatively unknown, right? So what do you think? Yeah, so like the med school was established in 2009, mm -hmm. or maybe like 2008, but like the first batch was inducted in 2009 and they graduated in 2015. I actually attended the convocation of the very first batch like that was our very very first medical school december 7th 2015 the uh, first batch was graduating that's the day we came to shalamar okay. very first time um so yeah new college nobody knows about it much i mean now they're probably starting to know more about it but like in the past nobody knew much about it the only thing we knew in 2015 when we you know knew that um we we're gonna get admission in a medical school because i'm um, going back to the mcat thing i didn't do super well on it mm -hmm. um I believe my aggregate came out to be 84.8 or 84.9. Which in like sin standard, I think that is pretty good. But it because is? yeah, it is 80. Like if you if like I don't, it varies every year. Okay. But if you score in the 80s, that's pretty good. Oh wow. Like depending on the test. But I think in Punjab, like the scoring cutoff of like King Edward and stuff is like what 90, 95, 96. So it's, yeah, wow. Yeah, relatively harder. I mean, now it's even more instant. Like now you have to have an 80 merit of 88 or 89% to even make it to SMDC, which is our medical college. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so it's very mean. competitive. Yeah. In general, like it's very competitive. But in the, back then, I think I barely made it uh, like below the cutoff for a government institute. And when I say government institute, I mean um, things way, way remote, like some medical school in DG Khan, I forget the name. Um, so like... I barely made it to that merit, and obviously, like even if I had made it um, in a government institute, I don't think I would have gone that far from family. So that was a priority. So back when we were looking at medical schools, it was like, okay, so which has the most rigorous study schedule, which produces the better results? And they say that um, in Punjab, it was CMH and Shalamar. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember sitting uh, the NUMS test for CMH. I think that's the year 2015 that it lost, not exactly lost, but like replaced um, its recognition from UHS to NUMS. So it was then under NUMS that I had to take that test. Um, I didn't really do much, uh, prepare much for it. I also took the SAT um, just for CMH. I, I didn't prepare much for it. Again, this is like, this goes back to me talking about how I felt like, you know, medicine was just something I felt like I had to do, not exactly chose to do as much mm -hmm. at that point. So, yeah, so it yeah. was just like a chore, like you have to get through it. I didn't give it much thought. So long story short, I ended up in Shalamar, yeah. Okay. Um, and that was 2015. Okay. It at the end it all turned out well so it, like yeah so i guess like the point i want to like just like be like so we get a lot of questions that oh we didn't get into a medical school of our choice yeah yeah is it the end of our career so i think Absolutely like junaid not. is that living example that it doesn't matter what medical school you're from like you can make it you yeah. know i know like, i'm the first example but yeah i am like example. there are plenty but then like on this platform like junaid is the first one okay so uh, my second question is what is the trend of USMLE in Shalamar Medical and Dental College? Okay, so present tense, like what is the trend? I think it's getting much better, especially because I think this year, again, a little bit of history, sorry. Um, yeah. 20, uh, 2019, that was my fourth year of med school. That was the year, and this is something I learned after I matched, right? Yeah. That was the year the first person from medical school matched. Um, in 2019. In 2019. And this university was open when? 2015 again? Uh, oh, 20. Uh, 2009. 2009. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so they were from the Pioneer batch. They graduated in 2015. Okay. And they matched in 2019. That was the first person from med school to match at all. Um, by the time that, that's also the year I started my preparation for step one, my fourth year of med school. Um, so I applied in 2022 for match 2023. And by that point, I knew of five people from med school that had matched till then. Five people. That's it. And like just to put context into this uh, value, um, I think in the year 2021, the year I matched from Dow Medical College, we have an upward of like 70 students in total just matched. So like just to put into context, yeah. like I just want to put emphasis on the fact that it's a relatively unknown medical school, like and that shouldn't be an excuse for sure. Yeah, like yeah, it does. I mean, there are some limitations and some considerations. We'll talk about those, but like um, the trend now is getting much better because this year. Mm -hmm. um, alhamdulillah, seven people from med school matched. 
you know so it and just, it's a batch of how many students? it's a batch of almost 150 medical students per class um i'm the only person from my class to apply in 2022 for mass 2023 nobody else has applied yet they will a, a few of my colleagues are going to be applying this year so let's see how that goes i'm hopeful for them um but like now there's more than 10 people from med school who has met so a few of us got together um and we did an online quote unquote um you know you could call that meet the match thingy for our um, medical students at Shala Mar where they got to ask some questions. We also did a presentation on the USMLEs and I specifically emphasized the importance of having a complete application, not just focusing on scores, mm -hmm. which was something I did a lot on. Um, so I think that has been helpful for people and in general, like in our juniors, which I've been interacting with, there's a lot more awareness regarding the US uh, route, not just with USMLEs, but also with research. Mm -hmm. People are being ambitious. They're targeting specialties bes besides the primary care specialties. Um, so I think it's getting better, much better than compared to when I was, because when I was uh, um, preparing for the USMLE, I was the only person from my class doing so. Mm -hmm. Like there was no culture. There was so, no such thing as dedicated preparation or not dedicated preparation. There was no preparation. Mm -hmm. On that note, like following that, that train of thought, what challenges did you face yeah, yeah. due to the lack of USME training? Um, I think the very first thing that I would emphasize on is that uh, for me, uh, I knew that I would want to come to the U.S. right from my first year of med school. Like I was giving thought to some alternative, like maybe PLAB, maybe work in Pakistan back in 2015. Like things weren't nearly as grim back home as they are now. So like it was, it wasn't that big of a deal to think about prospects of staying in Pakistan. But nevertheless, I knew that I would want to come to the U.S. eventually. So um, I just knew that it, there is something that is lucrative financially um and that's it like i didn't know the standard of medicine is too different here versus there at that particular moment mm -hmm. especially even though my parents were doctors like they practiced here like they didn't comment too much on it i used to share my plans with them they were like it's up to you, you can do whatever you want mm -hmm. um so at that particular moment it wasn't too big of a um, thing on my mind but as the years progressed i think it became more evident that i might want to focus more on it so i started my preparation in 2019 again completely cut off from um, most people and just all on my own I, I think at that point what I felt was like there was no guidance right nobody told me what resources I should be using mm -hmm. like it was just me the internet and my two main gurus student doctor network on reddit yeah. yeah that's it like I, I didn't know what Anki was what Bose and Beyond was until my final year of med school at which point I was gonna set my USMLE step one again we'll come back to that but like there was no guidance it was a bad thing but this was also kind of a good thing because I got to experiment very early on at a, a, according to exactly what I wanted to do, right? Yeah. Like there wasn't, oh, you must and you must do things this way or you're not doing it effectively, quote unquote, said by a senior who did it some, so many years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just doing things on my own mm. and in my own manner. And I think while it was painful, it was also very liberating to know whatever I'm accomplishing, I'm doing it at my own pace, by my own ways. Like, so if, if suppose, like, I think the DAO, because there's so much guidance yeah, yeah. and like every senior talks about it. So like, I feel like the biggest challenge as an IMG is obviously year of graduation does matter. It does yeah. play a role, right? The earlier, the better. So uh, one thing is managing your local medical school exams with your USMD. You can't compromise on either. Yeah. And you got to make sure you're also studying for this. So for me, being in Dao, I knew that there were like 10 other, and 10, 15 other friends in the same library studying for USME and not studying for Dao. Yeah. We were like compromising a little bit on our Dao exams as compared to USME, knowing that if we study this well, we would eventually cover that. So like I had people I would take risks with. So like, like just to think that taking that risk alone, like I don't know how you did it, but like that must have been hard. And you know, like yeah. learning to take risks by yourself without guidance yeah in general like telling uh, you it's possible yeah medical school in general was a whole like it, it was a it was five years of explosive transformation in my personal life i will say like if, if you re reach out to me in 2015 when i started medical school i would not be having this conversation with you yeah i would be like no I, i'm way too camera shy i don't want to talk about it like there has been a lot going on in medical school for me like even in personal life outside of medical school a lot was going on mm -hmm. so i felt like yeah like it, a lot of things were the uh, things that i the risk that I took mm -hmm. without any clear um, 
very clear, vivid goals that I would achieve mm -hmm. in the start. And then it gradually I got more focused. But yeah, it was, it was challenging, but at the same time, very rewarding. All right, my next question is, um, when do you start your USMLE preparation? Yeah, um, I, I hinted that early on, right? So um, 2019, fourth year, that was the year I started. And specifically in March of 2019, I remember, I think I was in my cardio rotation in medicine. This was your final year? Fourth year. Fourth year. Fourth year, okay. yeah, just like you guys. 2019 was the fourth year. So um, I remember uh, purchasing BRS, Board Review Series, but for physiology. I had read on the internet it was a good book for physiology and I was like, okay, I'll just start with that. I purchased that and I knew first it is a thing. So I purchased first year 2019 at that point as well. So I started reading those. Um, and in November, 2019, um, by this point I had, I think I had completed one pass of first aid that they called passes for you. Well, I think they called passes for first aid as well. Yeah, like the first read. Yeah, yeah, the first read. So I had completed the first read for uh, first aid by November, 2019. This was the time in our, um, I don't know if you guys can relate because you had semester system in your profession, IV had professional exams, we had annual. Both. We like, had both. Like we had semester until fourth year and okay. then after fourth year they're like, we're going to change to annual. Oh, okay. So we had everything, yeah. So you you had, had experience with a professional examination in your final year? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you know how this works, right? Yeah, yeah. So we basically um, had our written component of the examinations early on and then we had our vibas later on, right? Is that Oh. No, it was, we have our exams at the end of the year, Okay, but written and viva together. Okay, so yeah, we, we, when we were done with our written portion of the exams, we had a viva, like I think there was a break of one week before the viva started, but then they were convicted until the end, right? Oh, okay. So it was during that time that I picked up UVO for the first ever time online. This was which year? End 2019. Of, yeah, end of no, fourth year. Yeah, uh, almost end of fourth year. During my professional examination, I started UVL for the oh, first wow. time. <laughs> yeah, so I do not recommend anything similarly adventurous. Please do not do that. It was not a good time to do that, but mm -hmm. I started anyway. And um, I remember um, the fourth year exams ended and there was a break of two weeks before final year started. I used to do 80 questions per day wow. in those days and I was like, I wish there were more than 24 hours in a day because they weren't enough to review two blocks for the very first time you're doing UO. And I was like, okay, this is not sustainable. I knew that it was not sustainable, but I had also put this pressure on my mind that I have to take step one by April 2020, right? Which never happened. Um, April 2020 came, I took an assessment. I did not do super well on it for those of you you guys know step one is pass fail now, right? But yeah. back then it was a score and I didn't know which specialty I wanted at that point. So I wanted at least a 250 plus because I felt like it opened doors for all specialties. I didn't know what a research was, US clinical experience was. I just knew that if you have a 250 plus, doors are open for all specialties. Yeah. So I was preparing with that mindset in, uh, you know, in my brain. Um, April 2020 came, but so did COVID as you all know, yeah. in March, right? So I wasn't even doing well on my assessment. So I had to defer my exam anyway, but uh, classes went online. I started preparing for the exam even more seriously than I previously was, which I think was already pretty serious. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I did that for until June 2020 with online classes. So, you know, you are mostly at home. You can study a lot and it helped me. And I was attaining my goal score. And yet at that particular moment, like I had to um, delay my exam again because Promatric was closed in Lahore. Mm -hmm. And I think in like the whole of Pakistan in 2020. Yeah, yeah, it was peak COVID. It was peak COVID. So everything was closed. So at that point, I was like, okay, so my final year is going on. And I clearly am not uh, going to sit the exam anytime soon. And I am already at my gold score. Like for everybody who has at least taken step to CK score, like both of the exam score, you know the concept of peak, right? Once you reach it, it's, it's very likely that you go down. And that's kind of what happened with me. Um, I knew that it would not be a good idea to sit the exam then, so I decided to take it after final year, after I graduate, even though I was more than ready in my final year to take it. So I sat it in August 2021. I dropped 10 points from my original uh, previous score in um, 2020. And that was step one. So after that, I chose to do three months of um, house job in psychiatry, in the outpatient clinic. That's also when I started preparing for step two CK. Mm -hmm. So after the house job concluded, I signed up for a volunteer gig uh, with an NGO, uh, which was recommended to me by our psychiatry HOD in Lahore. And while I was doing that, and obviously while I was doing house job, I was preparing for my step to CK. Um, I ended up giving my step to CK in April, 2021. Went well. Then I did a tele rotation. Then I came to the US 
Oh, and by the way, okay, we'll talk about visa issues later. But I came to the U.S. in July, in August 2022, and I got done with one more talent rotation and one in-person observership and step three. Okay. So by the time I applied in um, 2022, September, I, I think I had most things on my application besides research, no publication. Okay, wait, like, uh, wait, that was a lot of information. So yeah. wait, let me just summarize, wait. So you graduated when? 2021. Which month? May 24, 2021. May. So May you graduated May 2021. You yeah. gave your step one in August 2021. Yes. And you gave your, and then you did started three months of house job with um, psych volunteering gig, right? Yeah, the volunteering gig started after my house job concluded. So okay, so three months yeah. psych and then volunteer gig and then you were studying for CTA side by side. When did you give your CTA? April 2022. April 2022. And then you did a month tele rotation? Yeah. And then you went to the US. Yeah. So April 2022, you went to the US one month. So like May, you went to the US, May, June? No, I went to the US in August. August. Yeah. And then you did uh, the application of the matches close at September 28th. And then you did how many months uh, USC? I did another month of tele rotation in August and one uh, on-site um, observership in September. In September, in September, before September. the deadline. Yes. And then you managed to give the step three as well. Yeah, that was in August. Okay, wow. Okay, so you basically had two tele rotation and one USC, one month USC. Yeah, observership. Like on site. Yeah. With step three done before the deadline or after? Yeah, the deadline? before the deadline. Okay, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that is very impressive. Thank you. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, and okay, like the follow up question to that was. Okay, so I feel like the like I, I think I touched on it a little bit earlier. The biggest challenge for me was managing medical school as well as USMA. Yeah, yeah. Right. So how did you manage medical school exam and USMA? Like you said that you started your uh, U World during your fourth year exams. Yeah. So like, how did you manage? Like, did you give more time to USMA or did you give more time to your Shalamar exams? What did? How did you manage it? What was your like thought process? Like usually, I think in Pakistan, I think like majority of the seniors who do the USMA, what they recommend is study for your university exam at the very end. If you have substantial USMA knowledge, you would cover. Do you believe that is true? And is that what you did? Pretty much, yeah. I feel like just studying for the USMLE seriously, like, and I would say seriously, after I started UVL in November 2019, that was the serious portion of the preparation. I do think that prior to that, the way I was approaching professional examinations and just medical tests in my medical school in general, like it was a very superficial way of approaching them. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of what the uh, the way the tests were designed. That's the approach they demanded. Like you couldn't delve too much into um, a very uh, conceptual things. Like you had to just know very broad, very superficial things. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I dealt with those exams. But after I started preparing for the USMLEs with UVL in hand, uh, my approach changed. And so did I think uh, my performance in those medical school exams. Cause I, um, in my final year, my final year professional examination, I did not prepare for it seriously. I had a lot going on in my life at that point, like from a personal standpoint outside of USMLE, that basically just um, didn't allow me, I, I think afford me the possibility of seriously studying for a professional exam. I just focus on surgery as a subject um, in my final year and the rest of it, I just focus on like my past papers for those exams. Uh, the other rest of the subjects. Yeah. Whatever informed the knowledge uh, that got me through those exams besides the past papers was my USMLE step one preparation. Uh, yeah, I think I had a similar story that you study for USMLE. Yeah. And then at the end, you just selectively do the past papers, selectively read the specific topics, which you realize is important, more important through the past papers. Now basically, the things that you might be able to elaborate on in a better fashion once you're in the actual exam because they do have those short essay questions you have to talk a little bit in more in depth about so if you know the pointers for what you're supposed to answer in them and if you already possess the knowledge which you would if you study seriously for those exams you just go through the motions at that moment okay. like on the actual exam you okay. don't have to cram anything so i think like at least in Pakistan, the way like yeah it is like a universal truth that usmd knowledge does make you capable enough to ace your yeah, the university exams. The knowledge is there, but um, you do have to, like, change your frame of mind when you're approaching Pakistani exams. Yeah, like, I think it's more rata based. Than yeah, sometimes that gets on your nerves up because uh, when, switch. The, yeah, switching. By, by the point I was sitting my final year professional examinations, like I saw the MCQs and those exams, and I was like, this is not you will, clearly yeah. not you will, yeah. and I'm infuriated at the amount of content I just need to have memorized, yeah. wrote memorized. Yeah, but I have to deal with it so. 
Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. All right, my next question is, did you have any extracurricular in your early medical school years? I did not. So, like, like first, second, third year of medical school, like, did you just go to class, ward, and home? No exactly. other extracurricular? Yeah. You didn't volunteer Nothing. for anything? No. no. Okay. Uh, question five. Why psychiatry, considering it's super com competitive for IMGs? Like, for example, me, I knew it was competitive. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know. I wasn't that much interested in psychiatry, so I never considered it. But all I knew was fields like dermatology, surgery. For IMGs, they're very, very competitive. Like, it is doable. People do get into it, but it's super competitive. So why psychiatry? Yeah, I mean, that's an easy question to answer. I didn't know it was competitive at all. <laughs> so I, you're, I didn't again, know it was competitive. Exactly. Ignorance is bliss. I didn't have anybody to guide me regarding the USMLEs. I didn't know competitive specialties. Yeah. Yeah, but I, even I think um, back when in 2016-17, like, I think that's the time when psychiatry started climbing on the competitiveness scale. Like, by the time I applied, yeah, sure, it was super competitive, but early on it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't think my knowledge of what is considered competitive was just informed by people telling me, again, Dr. Circle, that, uh, XYZ is in uh, USA and they're practicing a specialty and you're like what specialty like the internal medicine and I was like okay so that's what everybody does so they were like there's internal medicine and then there's surgery which is super competitive mm -hmm. so I was like okay I might not be doing your surgery even though there was a brief period in my second year of med school where I was interested in neurosurgery and that was after I was done with neuroanatomy as a subject yeah. but like that that quickly dwindled after I realized what I was up against mm -hmm. and also the lifestyle no way no offense to any neurosurgeons watching this I'm sure you guys are doing an amazing job keep up the good work but like I knew I would not be aiming for surgical specialty but for my psychiatry um, I think yeah um, and I said this in the med school interview as well like the ones they have I don't know if Dal has it like if before no. you enter medical school like they conduct their own interviews besides whatever Dao else does. they have that they Dao, Dao does have one but it's, yeah so that, that's the case with some private med schools and I think they conduct their own interviews as well okay but like so yeah I said that even at that point like I was interested in anything and everything that would basically require me to think a lot mm -hmm. which was kind of mostly medicine you know most most of medicine requires you to think a lot uh, critically um, but I like to get into the nitty-gritty of details and uh, anything related to neuroscience really you know was interesting to me I wouldn't say something that I would do for a living especially considering I didn't pay much heed to what I would want to do early on just enter medical school um, but that was something that was always on my mind no pun intended that i would want to do something related to neurosciences so psychiatry yeah i mean for, on, on the academic side and the research side maybe it is neuroscience heavy but not on the practical side of things as much yeah so in my final year of med school um COVID happened right COVID hit i got to spend time at home i think in those uh, several months in those five to six months during the time that i spent home um, thinking about what would happen like so med school was going to end in like 2021 I knew that but like what were they gonna do prior to those several months I had not given it much thought again like going back to my patterns of not thinking about what I would want to do seriously I just knew that whatever I was up against I would not be wanting to have a lifestyle that is not conducive to you know just having a good balance and I have seen my parents work you know i seen my father work as a journalist practitioner and i seen my mom work as an ob guy and i knew that the doctor's profession in general and again but finally you have seen an explore specialty so you know what lifestyle looks like on those i came to know that realize that i like maybe like internal medicine just for the purposes of using that in the usmles and treating the usmles as a game to play yeah like there's this um patient with a set of lab values um, and a differential diagnosis, you just have to pick the correct diagnosis and you win and you get that reward. You know, feel that feeling of reward once you get that answer correct. I was like, this is it. I don't care about internal medicine more than that. I don't care about, um, I, I don't find myself, you know, caring about that actual human being who would be on the other side of the screen in real life with those symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, if this is the extent to how much I like internal medicine, um, maybe this is not it, you know, maybe this is not what I want to do. And then it hit me that, you know, you have to go back to neurosciences. You have to go back to what you liked. At that particular moment, and this is also made on made its way to my personal statement. I'm going to get too personal here. Um, but basically, there was a, a traumatic experience in my life in 2020 that required me to seek help mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, I think that also really got me to think about how it is being on the patient side instead of the doctor side of somebody who would counsel you, who would get you and listen to you through difficult times. And 
I thought like that was really nice. That was really helpful. I really felt um, very satisfied after having my voice heard. And I thought, you know, I, I recall my friends telling me things like, you know, Junaid, it was nice to talk to you. It was good to have you as somebody who will listen to my problems. And I was like, I can leverage this. Mm. I can leverage these uh, skills and I can leverage my interest and apply in a specialty where they can be utilized in a much better fashion. Mm. Like, I'm not sure how much good listening can help you in radiology or mm. pathology, but it can certainly help you a lot in psychiatry. So I think it was a combination of that and everything that I explored on the internet regarding it, the options, um, and the variety of settings, mm -hmm. but not the competition. I was not even aware it was competitive until I actually applied. Mm -hmm. But now I would say it was super competitive. But yeah, those were my Your reasons for doing psych. Okay. Um, did you do any USC and when did you do it? So I think we did touch on this. So, yeah. But if you want to elaborate on it again. I mean, um, one of my, the first teleportation I did in Pakistan, like that was through an agency. Well, uh, do you remember the name of the agency? Yeah, FMG Portal. FMG Portal. Were they reliable and everything? Uh, yeah, the agency was reliable. Why you? Why tele rotation though? Like, so basically, like you know how it was in COVID, right? Yeah. Uh, you could forget about any hands-on clinical experience as mm -hmm. far as rotations went. I don't know how it was for internal medicine, but for psychiatry, that was the case. Okay. That is unfortunately still the case for psychiatry electives. Mm -hmm. But for psychiatry observerships, like even they were very scarce. It, okay. Like the US was a psychiatry observership desert at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, so I knew that I was gonna apply. I had my scores back. My scores were really good and I knew that I was within one year graduation, like I could do it. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't gonna waste that time. So I signed up for a tele-rotation at that particular moment. I would not say it was a good, um, you know, it wasn't good money-wise. Like I spent $2,000 on that, mm -hmm. on the tele-rotation. I don't think it was worth it in uh, the sum of money, but the experience for sure I guess wasn't it's, bad. it's also like, just make do of you know what you have yeah what you have like if that's what if that's the only thing in front of you then that's the only thing you can do it right so wait you did two of months of tele rotation yeah, the first one to uh, an agency the other was to a doctor who is known to offer um observerships but like remotely remotely yeah like okay like tele tele rotation yeah, tele -rotation. but not through an agency no and then the third month in the month of september yeah. you did one month of usc was that at a clinic or, so or a hospital so basically, my Khalu, who lives in the U.S., he is a retired nephrologist. Mm -hmm. And when we told him, and I don't know why we didn't think of doing this sooner, but when we told him that we were looking for a psychiatry experience, U.S. clinical experience, he was like, so I know somebody at my hospital who used to work at us, who still works as a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So like, you could maybe work with him, like, I'll ask. And we were like, okay. He said that we might be getting an answer as to whether I can rotate with him or not by end of August. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have two tele two tele-rotations. I have a lower from them and september is approaching and i don't know if i'll be able to do one more and just to provide context for those that don't understand so before september 28th which is the deadline for the mat you need three lors and ideally from doctors who practice in the united states so that's why because that's why you had two yeah. tele rotation and then one on-site rotation you came here which you found via your nephrologist relative yeah am i right yeah basically okay and was that like a hospital inpatient or it wasn't clinic? an inpatient unit okay that's yeah cool. okay uh, so my que follow-up question to that was, how did you find those USC? So we got a lot of questions, like how do we find electives? How do we find observerships, right? So I always have like one advice, like um, the generic advice, I think every senior, the advice I received was email seniors. Sorry, email, send a lot of yeah. emails, right? Uh, that is true. Like I, I did that. I'm sure you did that too. Did you send emails? I started sending e emails in after my CK was done, like in April 2022. So like, needless to say, that was pretty late. But you did, you did send yeah, it. I tried and to. I started early, but then I did not yield fruitful result from sending out emails, right? So this is the advice which like, I don't think is given out too much. Um, where our parents are from the subcontinent and you know, um, I think Asian culture is that if you are smart, become a doctor, right? So I always tell like whoever asks me for how do I find USC, I'm like use that to your advantage, okay? Have there's always a relative, a cousin, somebody's son, a popo's son, or whoever. Yeah, is, somebody is, is a, a doctor, point. right? Yeah. So, and like majority of the people they're either in the United States, the UK, or if not Pakistan, like like the doctor community is really small. So I, the advice I always give is please reach out to your own relatives, your own parents. For sure. Ask somebody and you know just find somebody for you in the united states like and i think like that worked out for you right yeah exactly i wish I sent, we had done that sooner yeah i sent hundreds of emails nothing worked out so what i did was i went to my father and like 
obviously my father he is much older than me so his friends are probably in a better position if they are a doctor in a hospital right they would be in a more senior position so yeah. they know more people so i'm like can you ask someone to find me an observership and whatnot and that's how i found my observership and to hear that you yeah. had a similar story i'm like okay so like that advice which i've been giving out is valid holds true for two people at yeah. least but uh, there's also the concept that you know not everybody has doctor parents that is a privilege in and of itself and my dad's not a doctor yeah exactly and again to even have connection with somebody who would know a doctor because you can go very big very very deep but and also when i give this advice what i mean is please reach out to people on linkedin emails yeah. like that has to go on side by side but si- parallelly do the other thing the yeah. usc uh reaching out to relatives and stuff yeah because even having access to people who can provide you like i, I would say that is also based on luck mm-hmm. like we're super privileged to have people who were able to provide us rotations because a lot of people unfortunately despite all the reaching out that you are unable to get it yeah just to provide context none of my parents are doctors yeah. like i don't have any doctors in my family so it was a struggle but again i just use the fact that they see people are usually doctors my dad had a lot of doctor friends so yeah. it worked out all right how important is it to have psych specific usce for psych did you have is, were both your tele rotation psych oriented or yeah i uh, whatever what? i put on my application like it was i was going to say 99 for something percent but no it was completely psychiatry it was nothing medicine related no, no internal medicine tele rotation not at all and uh I'm, you just went all out no backup by it no like by the time i graduated in may 2021 i knew psychiatry is what i was going to do so i just went all in um but like that's not going to be the reality for most people most people will have something related to internal medicine mm-hmm. so while they're talking about it i'll just clear that out that if you have something related to primary care in general not just i am like that's not a bad thing i know people say that your cv should be 100% psych focused like there should be no backup there should be no indication of a backup i don't think just having some experience on your cv that is not psych specific is automatically an admission that psychiatry is a backup for you mm-hmm. you could have explored your interest in psychiatry even in that specialty because when you're doing psychiatry residency your first uh, year that does involve at least four months of um, primary care rotations for us that's uh, internal medicine family medicine so like you can use that to your advantage as well um, but going back to your original question about site specific usc and how important that's it that it i don't think i can provide um give, give a definitive answer to how important is site specific us clinical experience in general like what psychiatry really cares about is commitment to the specialty that could be through usc that could be through research which is increasingly what most people have if you're applying to psychiatry like a lot of people have a lot of publications i did not have any by the way um and in addition to that there's volunteer experience that you can do on extracurriculars in psychiatry that you can do so psych specific usce yes it will help you and some programs unfortunately do re- require mm-hmm. that you have hands on rotation not observerships hands on rotation in psychiatry to um get interviews but that is not always work out and i think people i know somebody this year who's from gsmu who matched in psychiatry with eight interviews without ever having set foot in the us and any us clinical experience what she did was she worked with usmds in karachi who were board certified psychiatrists and she got lors from them and those helped her so if nothing else get work and lors from board certified us psychiatrists because if you go on program website they would say we require three lors from board certified american board certified psychiatrists they do not specify if they want them to be from Pakistan or from the US. They just want letters from US MDs who are psychiatrists. Okay. So, if I say the safe answer is yes, you should try to have yeah, psych at least one psych related rotation uh, and then you could have primary care rotations as well. Yeah, sure, for sure. But like don't be the person who has nothing psych related or like three primary care rotation then you have one psych publication or one volunteer experience and you're applying to psychiatry that just won't make sense to them you probably won't match um how important is research and score for psychiatry and to follow up on that should that research be psych related so again um as i hinted earlier i had no publications i received 11 interviews alhamdulillah and i matched so i will say that research is important if done with a purpose and when i say done with a purpose i mean like are you, or do you have specific academic goals like do you foresee yourself as somebody who would go down the physician scientist route or are you somebody who has some red flags on their application you need to compensate for or are you doing it to make connections and from there you want to branch out to more things like more clinical experience more opportunities but if none of those apply to you and you're just doing it for the sake of doing it just to add a number i don't think that's going to be very helpful 
yes if the more research you have the better um but i really feel like it has to be tailored to your goals i did not have research and the most of my interviews were from community programs there were two from university programs i felt like if i had a lot of research maybe my invitations would have been skewed a little bit more towards academic programs mm -hmm. but they still would have been mostly a community program either way mm -hmm. um so research yeah it's important but if you look at the nrmp data i think the average non-us img who matched in psychiatry had 9.1 abstract presentation posters like a total of those but that is very subjective because you don't know where what journal those were published in what kind of research you're talking about so that data isn't completely reliable mm -hmm. i would say try to do it if you can but if the rest of your profile is good your yog is fresh your scores are good you have volunteer slash clinical work your personal statement very important thing mm -hmm. is up to solid i think you you can still match and score they are important i know people say and this was this is something people told me as well like psych doesn't care about scores to a certain extent that historically was true but i don't think it's true anymore you should be aiming for good scores even if you want psychiatry and i mean look at the data like it's a competitive specialty guys uh the data junaid is talking about just search up nrmp data on google you'll find it you'll find every information you need you could fact check us yeah and if we're wrong just tell us in the comments you know you could correct us as well the NRMP program director survey is one table where they tell you what program directors look for and what specialty mm -hmm. to rank applicants and what they look for when they're interviewing them. What is look into to decide to interview this this applicant? Wow. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, so besides that, um, there's the um, what's it called? Like there's the other table where it lists the specialty and what the average score is. I think yeah. that's also the NRMP data for a specialty wise. Like you guys can look it up okay. so that data is helpful but not completely accurate because the img percentage is uh, totaled across all countries canada india um and other countries as well not just pakistan okay and how important is the personal statement and lors in psych yeah so if you look at this data that i just mentioned i, I love how uh, whichever question you're asking like it just branches off on the yeah, question. Right. like it's just a flow in, in this whole video like i, I like that so if you look at the data, personal statement and letter of recommendation, I believe they're going to be in the top three or at least if not the top two factors in both when program directors decide if they want to interview you and also when they decide if they want to rank you, which is new because people are told that if you have interview, like your profile doesn't matter. It does. And your personal statement does even after you've interviewed. Um, personal statement is extremely, extremely important. It can, I, I think, um, if you have... Well, I think we'll get to that later, but like personal statement in general it is considered to be an okay thing for most specialties. I know for internal medicine, they say, yeah, you should focus on it, but like it's not a break your application, right? No, it's not a make or break. Yeah. Make, yeah. In psych, it can absolutely break your application. So I feel like it's important to put effort into your personal statement. Um, I personally feel like my personal statement was a huge, had a huge role to play in me getting interviews because yes my scores are good but like i'm from a known medical school compared to a lot of other popular medical schools even in pakistan yeah. and we had people apply from aku king edward etc like mm -hmm. the big names yeah so they would have good scores they would have publications clinical experience so what do i have and i think my personal statement really played a significant role in getting a good number of interviews okay and your lors yes i mean so i'll say this um you know the acgme core competencies uh, one of them is uh, medical knowledge which is usually exemplified through your board scores but if your board scores are not really solid your LOR should comment on your medical knowledge just to comp it's just one way to compensate for a lower board scores they say the rest of your LOR if they talk about the more softer skills like your communication your um, uh, your work as a team player uh, with the people that you're working with I think those things really really help you and LORs Maybe not as important personal statement, but they also pay attention to those in psych. I would say in psychiatry, they tend to pay more attention to these subjective things like personal statement, LORs. Um, they pay more attention to those, but they do look at the object objective metrics like score, yes. especially for IMDs. Okay. Um, so you said that you did psych rotations after your house job. Yes. Uh, you did psych volunteering. Yes. A gig, right? So how did you how do you find? psych related extracurricular activities in pakistan for any psych you know oriented people like in pakistan i i don't think it's very much common it's not unfortunately and this is a big bottleneck for people who are trying to apply in psychiatry from pakistan like because they're like if you the programs want to see perceived commitment to specialty like how do you do that when you don't find the work 
so I think um, if you're, it depends on which uh, province you're in and which uh, city you're in more specifically. In Lahore, I found, um, I reached out to my psychiatry HOD, I would say reach out to your, uh, the head of departments in your respective medical schools, like they can help you and at least connect you with people who can um, then tell you of avenues where you can do humanitarian work, volunteer work, social work. Your volunteer program doesn't have to be specific, specifically related to psychiatry. The more specific it is to psychiatry, the better. But otherwise, I feel like any volunteer work works for psych. But it, just in general, like reach out to people from your medical school who are seniors, specifically your psychiatry HOD. Hopefully they connect you to something. Um, my psychiatry HOD connected me to mine organization. It's a charity uh, based organization in Lahore. They have several projects going on. I enrolled in one of those. If you're from Lahore, there's also Fountain House where you can choose to go and volunteer. And I'm sure like there are things like that in other cities as well. I just uh, know of these two avenues in Lahore. Okay. And even if you work with other big organizations, like if it's volunteer humanitarian work, I think it counts. Volunteer work doesn't have to be specifically related, related to psychiatry. psychiatry. Okay, so I could, you could volunteer anyway. For sure. All right. Uh, so you said you only did three months of house job. Yes. Do you think doing the whole of house job is important? And like, do you think it's necessary for the U.S.? This is also a lot of a common, very common yeah, question. I yeah. think juniors must reach out to you, and they did, they did, yeah. yeah. People from what do you did. like? What like obviously like the answer we give, yeah. It's like it's very subjective. So obviously, I think everyone who they should ask everyone and listen to everyone, but make their own decision. But if you were to give advice, what advice would you give? The advice I gave to my juniors was based on their respective situation. I asked them what's their visa status. Do they require a visa? Um, do they have their step one slash step two done or are they preparing for it? And I asked them, you know, when do they anticipate applying for the match? I asked them these three questions and then we went from there. I would say that, again, this is very subjective and it's completely dependent on the person. Like, I don't think me and Rafi would have uh, the same trajectories if we chose to do this. Like, it's completely dependent on the person. I would say to follow just a basic guideline, let's just say that. If you... Um, do you possess a valid visa or you don't require a visa, you're a green card slash blue passport holder. And on top of that, you have at least taken step one by the time you're graduating or you haven't, um, or you're at least preparing for it very dedicatedly and you're about to sit it. And you plan to apply for the match and you anticipate having rotations, research, the rest of your profile is, let's just say, gonna be ready in a year. In that situation, I can say that you could skip house job. Like if all of those things hold true for you. If any one of those things don't hold true for you, then looking at the situation I'm seeing right now with visas, especially visas, and just the competition that's getting there and people not having backups, I would not recommend skipping house job. I would have a backup. Job. Have a backup for sure. Like unless you fall into those and categories, then you know for a fact that this is what you want to do. I just want to uh, ask you: You did require a visa, right? I don't I think did. this was. Oh yeah. yeah, I did require a visa. And good question. Um, I applied for a B1, B2 visa appointment in August 2021 for July 2022. Okay. And I did not know what I would have by them. I just anticipated that I would have my step three permit in hand. Yeah. And that's what I went in with. And for some reason, I got the visa at that point. Wow. So like, yeah, a lot of luck played a role in this entire journey and visa issues are real. And I recognize those. So like, if I were to go back, I would still not change what I did. But if it were somebody else and I was advising somebody else, I would see if you're what credentials do you have? What your plans are? And I wouldn't, for most people, I would not recommend skipping house job. Yeah. All right. Um, the second last question. Oh, we're ending. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So you covered on a, a you covered a lot of stuff. You know, Eloa, personal statement, um, psych, um, ECA scores, everything. But if you were to pinpoint one thing, what is the most important part of the application? Oh, I hate to disappoint you. I don't think I can like. There's really no way to do the like, you can ask me to eliminate any one component of my application and ask me how I would feel about it, my chances. I don't think I can be confident. Like if you were to eliminate good scores, I don't think I would have has, had as many interviews. If you were to eliminate step three, I don't know. Personal statement, LORs, like everything has its place and everything has a role. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, the thing you were talking about the other day, like having a balanced application, I think maybe that's the most important thing. Have so, a little bit of- So everything. wait, I have a, uh, okay, so. Uh, if suppose somebody gets a low score, yeah, a relatively low score, do you think they should consider psych? For sure, they should. But they just have to compensate like with other stuff, right? Yeah. So psychiatry will value good scores. They will, um, you know, especially as IMGs, they will value both score. But again, 
this is what the data suggests, right? The NRMP data, not our personal experience, but the data that says that they value perceived commitment to specialty, which I think is exemplified by your CV and what you have on it, volunteer work, research, clinical experience in the specialty, hopefully. Like, I think if you have more of those, you do have a chance. Like, yeah, yes, if you have um, below average step scores, unfortunately, I would not be expecting double digit interviews unless you also require a visa or if you have, um, you know, a blue passport or something like that. Maybe you won't be getting a lot of interviews, even if you have other things on your application, but you still have a chance of matching. And I would not discard the journey just because you have a good low score. Okay. The specialty values psych specific work a lot. Okay. So the last question. Uh, any word or advice for those considering USM in general and maybe psych applicants? Um, I think, again, like we discussed throughout this whole video, like if you are planning for psychiatry, your competition, the US graduates, they have very specific interests. Like they will have interest in CL psychiatry, HIV psychiatry, and you ask a medical student in Pakistan what that is, and they'll be like, what, what is that, mm -hmm. right? So they have very specific interest and the programs are incentivized a lot to pick them over you. And like psych is a, not a level playing field at all. Like there are very few spots and a lot of US MDs and DOs um, applying for very limited positions. So as IMGs, you are at a very big disadvantage, unfortunately. With that said, try to have as much psych specific work on your CV as you can. You don't have to wait until you graduate. It's actually better to have extracurriculars and research if that's your game before you graduate and then apply with uh, psych-specific research, psych-specific work experiences. Do not give up if you have a low score. Psych can be forgiving even if you have low scores. Um, you just have to do a lot more and you should expect a lesser yield when it comes to interviews. And for people in general, like, especially for my folks uh, from Shalomar, if you're watching this, or people in general from medical school that are not well recognized, like, um, you guys will have to prove yourselves. Like if they have somebody from Shalamar versus somebody from Dow and like they're comparing those applications side by side, I think they will prefer the Dow person simply because they have had better experiences or more experiences, not even necessarily better. Like they've had people from Dow or they know this medical school in general, like it's, it's a recognized uh, medical school in the US residency programs. So they might be incentivized to pick them over you. So you must stand out. Score is one way to stand out, but so is the rest of your application. Um, do not give up. I didn't know the competition that I was up against, so I wasn't even that scared in the start, but going back, I think I would be very scared if I knew what I know now, and yet I, I would not give up. I think um, just the fact that you didn't know anything and lack of guidance yeah. made into advantage because... I, uh, I did say that, I, like it was an advantage as well as a disadvantage. Yeah, yeah. 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 looking back, now after I hear, listened to your whole story, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. I just went all in and I was like, I'm just going to do my best. And that's all you can do at the end of the day. Do your best. And I think if you're in medical school, just decide early what you want to do, what track, whether you have any plan, and just work hard towards it. That's difficult though. Like I, I think while we say that a lot, it's very difficult to actually do that because life gets in the way. Sometimes you will meet somebody you who's you know not exactly intent on staying in the yeah. US. Yeah. And then you're like, well, should I change my plan? Should I not? Sometimes you don't have the finances to immediately start. So like, it's difficult to plan early on, but if you can, yes. If you can, yeah, try. Sure, like, it helps out. So I guess this is the end of this very, very long video. If you made it till the very end, I'm hats off to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Um, thank you, Janet. You're again. welcome. Thank you.